Good to see everybody for our class this morning. Uh, thank you for giving me a moment to get settled in here. I ask that you be getting settled in with me with your Bibles. Open them up to Exodus chapter 21. I'll tell you what, even if you, if you find yourself in the book of Exodus, if you'll actually go back to Genesis chapter 15, we're in the same general place there, but I'll remember that we're actually going to be in Genesis chapter 15 first. You can have your Bibles ready there in Genesis chapter 15. We've been spending some of these recent lessons after wrapping up our history and geography class, kind of in an interlude before we begin some of our next series of lessons, which I think are going to be on Bible authority. But until we get there, we've just been picking, uh, for lack of a better term, quote unquote, random text and taking five particular questions that we can try to use and see that wherever we are in our study of God's Word, these are studies that are questions that will help us to think and to meditate on God's Word and to see some things we can learn or pull from this text and see and understand about the context of this particular passage wherever we are as well. We've been in Jeremiah 27 and 28. We see kind of a clash of some prophets there, kind of a narrative section, which is maybe kind of unique in the fact that Jeremiah is a prophet, but we're looking at kind of a narrative section there in Jeremiah 27 and 28. We had some time in Philippians chapter 2, just a short paragraph there in verses uh, 1 through 11, but some very rich conversation from there. We've spent some time in John chapter 20, looking at the resurrection of Jesus. And then, of course, David Banning was here last week, so we let David spend some time speaking with us and encouraging us. And today we'll be in Exodus 21 through 23. I've tried with these random passages to, at least in my mind, see that they're not so random and that we're trying to hit different sections or genre of scriptures with each of these times. So we spent some time in an epistle looking at the writings of Paul in Philippians 2. We spent some time at a kind of more narrative section, even there in the story of Jeremiah, some sections from a gospel account looking at the story of Jesus and his resurrection, and now looking at some sections of law. Uh, Vanessa and Miss Elsie were very kind and generous to tell me that this was uh, their favorite, or no, it was not your favorite, that's what they said, <laughs> reading for today, what we've done so far in this study is Exodus 21 through 23. Uh, this is a passage that, and you, you're like, could we not go back to the, the uh, chapter before? That's the Ten Commandments. I feel like I know that, and I'm going to test you on that in just a little bit. Uh, but we're going to look at this section of law and continue to ask these five questions. Uh, I'll admit that this may not be the same kind of discussion we've had with these previous two classes. Uh, one of our questions that we ask throughout this class is going to be, what questions do you have? And you may have lots of those for me, and I'm prepared to write your questions down, and you're prepared to receive my I don't know answer when you ask my question this morning. But I will try to do my best to look some things up if there are some things that I can look up for you for later. Well, we are going to spend some time in God's Word today in Exodus 21 through 23, starting in Genesis 15 in just a second to put some context. We're going to see what we can learn from this law. And it's not our law, but some things we can learn about God, some things we can learn about how God wants His people to behave, even though it is true this is not the specific laws we're called to keep under the Mosaic Covenant, and the fact that we are under the covenant of Christ, that we are still able to honor Jesus and to honor God and by thinking of the, some of the principles that are brought up in here. Uh, before we do that, though, let's have a word of prayer to get started. Danny, do you mind lead us in a prayer to get our class started today? So we're going to be in Exodus 21 through 23, but I've asked you to start in Genesis chapter 15. Before we get to Genesis chapter 15, we've done some work by thinking about the Bible within these 17 time periods, helping us put some references along the way about where is this going on in the history of God's people. So for those who have been in some of our history and geography class and still wanting to maybe implement and keep some of those outlets of the spider web in our mind and keep those supports, where are we? our 17 periods of biblical history. The, so the wandering the wilderness, if you said the exodus from Egypt, depending on how you draw that line, 
uh, I'd be willing to accept either of those answers. We are out of Egypt, and we have been kind of wandering in the wilderness already a little bit from Exodus chapter 16 getting to Mount Sinai. Maybe if you think wandering the wilderness and you're deep in the book of Numbers at that point, I recognize that and I'll concede you on that fact too. But we're somewhere here in the, in the Old Testament around that time that we recently left Egypt. We're not yet in the land of Canaan, started that invasion and conquest section. Let's get some passages to provide some background of our study for today in Exodus 21, starting in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 through verse 14. The Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Abram has already been told by God some of the things that God is going to do for him, like sending him to a far-off land, like making him a great nation, uh, like through his seed how all the nations of the world will be blessed. But what's he talking about when God speaks to Abram here in Genesis chapter 15 that might relate to our study today in Exodus 21? They're going to be slaves in Egypt. And so Becca's already been reading into our next section of Exodus 1, 5 through 8. We go to the book of Exodus now. Let's get some passage from Exodus to set up our law section for today. Exodus 1, verse 5, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph is already in Egypt, or was already in Egypt. Exodus 1, 6, then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That Pharaoh, that king then enslaved God's people. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through verse 25 You see in the days of a later king, it says in Exodus 2.23, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. This is exactly God saying what he was going to do. They were going to be there for a time, but God is going to bring judgment upon that nation for whom they have enslaved for that time being. And God is going to do something about all of this. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 8, just to pick a couple of things from out of this text here. At this point, Moses has already gone to Pharaoh. After God tells Moses, you know, you need to go to Pharaoh and ask to let the people be brought back and to let the people go. Maybe Moses kind of has this expectation of he's going to go and things are going to go well. There are some things that are talked about in when God speaks to Moses the first time. Uh, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. That's exactly what happens in Exodus chapter 5. Moses comes in and says, let the people of God go. And Pharaoh says, who is God? Who is the Lord that I should serve him? As the song says, no, I will not let them go. But more to the text of scripture, he says, who is the Lord that I should serve him and listen to his voice? And so he doesn't let the people go. Which you could imagine if you're the Hebrew people, which that brings more oppression and more conflict and more difficulties into your life, you're probably not happy with Moses right now. And you may even, uh, this might be us a little bit looking back into the situation that's going on, so take the opinion for what it is. You might even feel a little bit upset with God and the fact that you, he sent Moses here to say that there's going to be this great deliverance and everybody's excited at the end of chapter 4. And then by the end of chapter 5, they're thinking, why did you do this? Why did you make things worse for us here? So God picks up and speaks for himself and is defending himself, and that's probably not even the best way to phrase it, but God speaks to Moses and is encouraging Moses and the people in Exodus chapter 6. We pick up in verse 4. I established my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them the land of Canaan, the land which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant." Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession." I am the Lord. 
God says, be confident that I am going to deliver you and I am going to bring you out of this land, that I'm going to show my judgment and power and really embarrass the gods of the Egyptians and the nation of Egypt and show that I am more powerful, that this humble group of slaves are going to be the ones who are being delivered from Egypt, not because of their own uprising or revolt, but because of what God does, what their God does for them in this moment. Moving over to Exodus chapter 12, we see the beginning of some of that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 33 through verse 36. Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. They said, we shall all be dead. This is coming not long after the final plague of the death of the firstborn. The Egyptians are ready to get God's people out of there. Some of the Egyptians have been online for a couple of the plagues before this even, but after this, it's time for God's people to go before there's more destruction and death and embarrassment for the Egyptians. Exodus 12 and verse 34, So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and jewelry and clothing. The Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked, and thus they plundered the Egyptians. And so God's people leave. You're probably familiar with something that happens in Exodus 14 and 15, that Pharaoh somewhat has a change of heart and a change of mind, realizing he's lost a lot of his labor force. So as Pharaoh is pursuing God's people to the Red Sea, uh, briefly summarize what happens there. Can someone do that for me? Someone not named Becca or Rebecca? Well, spread the, spread the love around in the class today. What happens at the Red Sea? It's parted. It's this. I, I doesn't mean to do this, but it's, it is that separated. And the fact that God's people go through, and then the armies of Pharaoh are swallowed and washed up from all of that. Let's move forward then to Exodus chapter 19. Very quickly recounting some of the Exodus story, God delivers his people, brings them out of Egyptian bondage, just as he told Abraham that he would. He's keeping those promises, telling his people, I'm going to be faithful to keep that covenant. You are going to go to the land. You are going to be this great nation. There is going to be the seed that comes, particularly making those promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but letting them know they are going to be delivered. So in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be for me, or to me, a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to all the people of Israel." So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. There's more to say. There's going to be more in this covenant that people are going to agree to. There's more that's coming on even as God comes down on Mount Sinai. But establishing here that there's a relationship that's being built. There's God and the people of Israel are starting to come together in this special covenant. And God says, you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to be a, a holy nation. Uh, and you're going to follow the words that I tell you to do. And God's people are on board with that. They agree with that. There's kind of a baseline there, at least, of that. With something that we read about in Exodus chapter 20. Who can tell me that? commandments this morning start with miss rebecca all right let's pause she's got five someone's got to pick i've seen some of you vocalizing along let's maybe move to this side of the room someone pick up with number six we've got honor father and mother Someone not looking at Exodus chapter 20 as they're saying it? Can we do that for us? What comes after honor father and mother? Not kill? Steal. Steal. Adultery. Adultery. We, if we get a little bit out of the order, I'm not going to hold you completely against that today. So we've got kill, steal, adultery, false witness, and covet your neighbor's possessions. All right, so we've got the Ten Commandments there. The end of Exodus chapter 20, or at least Exodus chapter 20, Verse 18 through verse 21. 
All the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet that the mountain was smoking, and the people were afraid and trembled and stood afar off. Before, God told Moses the things he wanted the people to know, and the people responded and said, yes, we're on board with that. Now God is speaking, and it seems like it's not just Moses, but everybody is seeing in that cloud and fire and thunder and lightning that's there descending on Mount Sinai what God is saying. And so from there, uh, verse 19, they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. People stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So they're on board with the Ten Commandments. They're on board with the idea that we're going to be this holy nation. We're going to be this royal priesthood. We're going to join into this covenant with God, and we're going to be his special people. And God's going to talk more about that now, moving into Exodus 21 through 23, books like Leviticus, books like Numbers, books like Deuteronomy, these various 600 or plus laws that God is going to tell his people. These are part of what it means to be in the covenant relationship with me. So before we get to answering this question of what do you like and what did you not like, if you've had the chance to do the reading of Exodus 21 through 23 and kind of focusing in that text, some quick things to remember. The law was not given at Mount Sinai to say, keep these 616 laws or so and you will go to heaven. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about you are going to be in a relationship with me. And there's, you go to places like Galatians that make the fact that the covenant has a purpose. The purpose is not to say this is how you get to heaven when God delivers it. This the idea, a big part of what this is going to reveal, what we'll talk about today, is the idea of the laws revealing the lawgiver. We call this the law of Moses, or we often refer to it as that, and sometimes in scripture it's even called that, because Moses is the one who's often verbally speaking it to the people. But this does not originate with Moses. Who is the lawgiver of this law? God is. So when we read these laws, we read about things, again, I'm kind of planting some seeds here, we read about things like justice and mercy and compassion and fairness and equality and those types of things. Those are attributes of God that we're seeing being brought out and talked about through these laws and the way that God is having his people deal with one another, with their neighbors, with their enemies, and how they relate to him as well. So let's get into Exodus 21 through 23 for the last 20 minutes of our class or so, and spend some time talking about some of these questions. Maybe different from uh, John 20 or from Philippians chapter 2. Maybe you interpret this question a little bit differently and not what do you like, but what stands out to you. That's a fair assumption or a fair way to look at this question. What do you like about this text or what stands out to you about this text? Glow, is that a hand? Did make it, Miss Rebecca? So, in case we didn't hear what Miss Rebecca talked about, a lot of what we're seeing in these three chapters is just building upon the Ten Commandments that we just talked about a second ago. The things that we kind of talk about is, maybe we call that the basis of the Law of Moses, we kind of start there with that. 
these laws or these statements, uh, I'll call them laws, that's what they are, referred to as judgments or ordinances, they continue to build upon that and to give ex explanations of some of those things. Even within these three chapters, it may not hit every single specific details, but they're at least getting a very clear picture of what God is intending with this law and how they are supposed to use this law and interpret that law. So these chapters, just on their own, probably seem very, what do we do with this? But they are very much building upon what God has already told his people. Tracy? And this is a theocracy. There's no distinction between religious law and law of the land. It's mm -hmm. setting forth the law of the land, but they're interchangeable. And uh, you know, we live in a world that separates the church and state. We live in a world where there's secular laws and there's rules or expectations religiously or whatever, but this is, uh, these laws were set up for secular reasons. These laws are set up uh, to really establish and highlight the fact that you are my people and that I am your God. Uh, uh, is this the first law to have come into human history? You have examples in Genesis where Cain and Abel were already giving sacrifices. Why did they do that? Obviously, there were laws put in place by God before that. You also have God telling Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree, and that was a law given by God. So you've got laws that God gives about you shall not eat this, or you. Uh, particularly there in Genesis chapter 2. There are things about sacrifices in Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 8 and 9 seem to be understood by the patriarchs. We're going to get to you in just a second, Ms. Glenn. I see you. I want you to know you don't have to keep your hand. I'll come back to you. Uh, so Bible law is definitely there as well. Uh, outside of the Bible, laws for nations have existed before the law of Moses, like Hammurabi. Hammurabi. Egypt would have some of those things as well. Hammurabi is probably one of those that uh, if you want to really just hunker down on this cold, rainy Sunday afternoon and get yourself excited, grab a copy of the Code of Hammurabi online and grab Exodus 21 through 23 and start seeing all the similarities and slight differences between them. And there are some things that are similar, but some things that are different as well. But God is saying that even in some of those laws that he makes and talks about in here to make really the point of I'm not just like the nations around me but there are things of how I view people and so he's making this law it is related to how they're going to treat each other and treat people around them but there's always going to be that core highlight of this is God's at the center of that this isn't just Moses going to a council of people and taking votes how are we going to have our little community God is giving this law to them Miss Glenda Right. I think even later on in Exodus 23, there's some things. Uh, Exodus 23, 32 and 33, you shall make no covenant with them, that being the people, the lands you're about to go conquer, and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. There is some great foreshadowing there about the fact of you are my people, I am your God, do not worship these other gods. And if you do, problems will ensue. And people who have a little, bit, a little bit of knowledge of what comes in the book of Judges, the books of the Kings and Samuel and some of those places recognize God makes true to those things and says, you know what my covenant is. You start to commit adultery against me and go and worship these other gods. And lo and behold, things get difficult and bad for you. Surprise, surprise, not really, because I've told you about all of that. Let's move to the second part. Uh, those who have read this text, questions that you have about this text. I know there are maybe some of the things that they maybe just seem distant to us in some ways. Uh, um, I'll just leave it at the question we're asking, though. Questions you have about this text? And we don't have to have anything about that, so if not, then we can get in some other sections. But I want to make sure that there's this option in specifics that I can try to clear up for folks. Let's go to that third section, then. You look at these laws and what God is, is saying. Maybe we think specifically about Israel. 
But what are we learning about people from a text like Exodus 21 through Exodus 23? We've been able to learn some things about people like in Philippians chapter 2 about how sometimes people can be selfish and our need to be humble, and that's how we should be. What are we learning about people from Exodus 21 through 23? That's true. People want to do what they want to do. I want this animal, and I want to see if there's some way I can get around and say, well, I didn't actually steal it. I just kind of stumbled upon it out in the field, and I kind of got it to follow me, and now it just happens to live in my property. <laughs> there are some things that God says about things like that. Of, and just the idea that people... <laughs> Uh, want to do what they want to do and some of that. Other things we learn about people in this text. Clint? Well, it just reminds me of Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. I mean, it's over 2,000 years ago, and some of the same problems people were having today, they're still having them over 2,000 years ago. Um, Sin, sexual morality, anger, hatred, theft, all those things are still issues. Uh, some things that we learn about people, maybe about us, what people are supposed to be. Go to Exodus 22, if you would. Exodus 22, verse 31. This comes with uh, some more at the end of this verse. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. The first part of verse 31, though, what does God say to his people? Exodus 22, verse 31. You shall be holy. You shall be holy. Other, things, other versions say different things. Consecrated, this idea of separated, the idea of sanctified, distinct from the people around you. There's an expectation about God's people that while people do want to do what they want to do, and the problem of sin is as old as Genesis chapter 3, you see that God has expectations of his people, that they would be a holy people, and that these laws help people to know what God wants them to do, how to keep them distinct from the nations around them, how these laws help people to love their neighbor as themselves, how these laws help people from treating life less than what God values life as. Uh, let's get an example of that in Exodus 22, uh, excuse me, Exodus 21, verse 22. Exodus 21, 22. Men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out and there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him. and He shall pay judgments determined. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. There's just a, a small thought we could take from in there, the back to how God views those who have not yet been born and values them as life. Well, maybe some other nations might see that as, well, that's just a haphazard accident, and that's something that happens and move on. But God sees life in a very distinct way that life is special and sacred and that life is to be valued. And so these laws help people to see that they're not looking at just a me-centered lifestyle. It's God first, but it's also then the people around them that, you know, Tracy's got a really nice boat. I guess, is better than the boat I have because I don't have one. And so I might think, you know, if I really want to try to pick up fishing and catch up to my crossland, I need to get a boat. And so I might just go down there and get Tracy's boat. But because I love Tracy and respect him, because I love the Lord and respect him, I'm not going to do that. If I really want to catch up to Mike crossland, I'm going to need uh, Mike to slow down and I'm going to need to start getting some practice with fishing. Um, but all of that to recognize and see that I shouldn't take things from people because Tracy is pers a person, my brother. And I love him. And there's uh, with people's lives, with people's possessions, with people's animals, just the way that we treat other people. As we acknowledge, we learn about people that I want to do what I want to do, but I need to think more about how this affects the people around me. I mean, the, the people doing what they want to do is as old as the beginning of time. Hopefully this text is teaching us some things about people and what they should be and how they should be and some principles from within all of that. Let's go to this idea. What does this text teach us about God? He's fair and just. Mm -hmm. he, just like what you said, he wants us to, he loves us, so he wants us to treat each other like we love others, too, just like God loves us. Okay, he's fair and just. He wants us to, to love kind of similar to the way that he loves. Other things we learned about God? Is that a start of a hand, Miss Rebecca? No, no, it's okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Father, loving from this, 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which, yes, I don't want to hate it, but the knowing part it is. But I'm not going to change myself. But I, also, I can change myself. A mm-hmm. uh, couple of things based on what Mr. Beck is talking about. You have Leviticus 11, uh, Second Peter, or First Peter 1, some of those great statements of you should be holy as I'm holy. The thought here in Ephesians 5 is an important part to make, that the Ephesian culture was corrupt and, and wicked and had the issue of sin. And while maybe not all of the specific exact same things, there was an issue of their sin going on around these Christians. And the question becomes, are you going to stand out from against that, or is that going to seep into the church? You know, the idea of, I'm sure the Ephesians wanted to be that shining light. Are they going to be that shining light by letting the darkness in, or are they going to do that by letting the light shine into the darkness of the world and trying to help people see in their lives the need to become followers of Jesus as well. There's a, a very clear need for people to be uh, holy as God calls them to be. And again, while this is not our law, we can learn things from this law, what God expects of people, as he, he really is reflecting himself and his fairness and his justice, his equality. What else are we learning about God from this text? Tracy? Galatians 3 talks about- So Tracy's talking about Galatians 3.24 there. Some of your versions might say guardian uh, in Galatians 3. So then the law was our guardian or our schoolmaster until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. And just fulfilling God's plan, uh, bringing people to himself. He starts that with the special relationship with Abraham's family, working that through the time that Jesus comes, but helping them to see that I'm rescuing you. And that's what I'm going to do with all nations, but I'm starting with you. Uh, something we've tried to point out before is the fact, I think it was when we were in Philippians chapter 2, uh, what a great example about God's willing to go and rescue people than a people like Israel. Uh, we know some great people from Israel's history. We can talk about Samuels and Davids and Moseses and prophets and uh, women like Abigail and people like that. But you also know, look at Israel's history as a whole, and they're just some of the most stubborn and uh, rock-headed people who have ever walked on God's earth, how often they depart from his commands, and how often he goes and, and rescues them and calls them back to him through the message of repentance, how he shows them their need to follow him. And he's making that point to the world. As when Jesus comes and says, I'm fulfilling what needs to be done for all sin, now everyone come follow me. Uh, the law is helping give an example leading up to that. Glenn, was that the start of a hand a second ago for things? Clint? Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, as far as learning about God, you know, today there's a lot of confusion in the you know, religious world about what God expects and, you know, faith, faith without works, faith with works, and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, to see a lot about God and, and how he expects actions and if we act a certain way, you know, then there's consequences for not acting a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, and we recognize that <coughs> same principle applies in the New Testament, you know, but there's so many Christians out there that 
feelings and your faith and your, you know, your sins and your actions aren't really that big a deal to God, you know, if you believe and all that, you know, can you see probably even deeper than um, in the New Testament about God's um, justice and, and how he feels about people obeying his law? Uh, the point we've been making through our Deuteronomy series, and I think a similar point you could make here, really in any of these law sections, whether it's Exodus, Leviticus, or Numbers, or other sections like this moving on, is that God is enacting a covenant with people. He's building a relationship with people. He's the one who extends the hand of that relationship. Moses doesn't say, excuse me, we're really awesome here in Egypt, and you're not doing anything about it, so we're going to bring ourselves up to you, and then we'll join this covenant. God extends his hand to them and shows grace to them, and then they respond in faith to that, but that faith is not faith without works, or it is faith with works, it's just the faith is faith, and that faith is showing actions and obedience with it. It's intrinsic to what faith really is, that people respond to that relationship by doing what God calls them to do, what he expects of them to do, and when they fall short of that, need to repent and come back to God, just as so often Israel does, just so as often as you and I do, as we need to go back to God to maintain that relationship with him. Other things we're learning about God in this text in Exodus 21 through 23. My mind doesn't quite go there. I don't know if that's just ingrained in me, but it just sometimes shocks me that some of the sins that people are capable of. You ever seen any of those signs, those warnings? You know, you're on the third story of a railing. It says, don't jump over the rail. And you think you know, that has to be there because somebody was bright enough to do that. And then somebody realized, we got to put a sign up here so people don't keep doing that and keep doing those things. Uh, not a one-to-one -one comparison there with that, but to see what God is saying, uh, I mean, he has probably seen people for thousands of years do things like this. And so he's starting at the beginning of his relationship with his people to say, don't do these wicked things. Don't do these horrible things. But if you're really going to show love to me and show love to other people, this is how you do it. A couple of things. Awesome. Was that a hand? Did I start to, okay, I, I saw a movement, so I'll make sure I'm not missing anybody. A couple of things I have on my list. God cares for the oppressed. In Exodus 22, verse 21 through 24, Exodus 22, 21 through 24, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. You might think of James 1, 27 when you read that. Verse 23 of Exodus 22, you shall not, do not, if you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. God tells his people here to care for the sojourners and for the oppressed and for the uh, widows and the fatherless, but that is a reflection of God's own care for these people. God is just and truthful. In Exodus 23, verse 1 through verse 3, just an example of this here, Exodus 23, 1 through 3, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be malicious witness. You shall not fall in with many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. Why does God care if we're partial or impartial? Why does God care if we're fair or just or not? I mean, why not just the people who are better off get to enjoy being better off, and the people who are poor can sneak their way up and can join people up there? Because God himself is fair and just. God is not somebody who can be bought off with sacrifices or with money or with gifts. He's reflecting himself through laws like this of his own fairness and his own justice. God does not acquit the wicked in verse 20, or chapter 23 and verse 7. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. God is not to be treated like any other God, and God keeps his promises. God helps uh, his people find freedom. Uh, in Exodus 21 and verse 2, Exodus 21 and verse 2, When you buy a Hebrew slave, you shall serve six years, and the seventh year you shall go out free. 
for nothing. The idea of there's this expectation of this is not lifelong service. There's going to be freedom for this person. That they can enjoy not just scraping back in the bottoms of society again, but going out free to be a part of society where they're able to help other people and, help, uh, and be helped themselves as well. We see that God uh, is a God of blessings and remembrance. Uh, and we see that God fights for us or against us. Really, Exodus 23, I think, is making that point. Exodus 23, you have in verse 23, this example or him talking about this angel, <clears throat> excuse me, who's going to fight the way for them and lead the way for them. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor as, do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillows into pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take away sicknesses from among you. In verse 27, I will send my terror before you, and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I will make your enemies turn their backs to you. The idea that the people are faithful to God, and that they're following these commandments, God is going to fight for his people. He's on their side. But if they rebel against him, we already read the end of this chapter, in verse 31, verse 33, if you worship these gods, if you break this covenant, I'm going to be a snare to you, and I'm going to be against you. Some things to think about in there of, do we want God fighting for us? Do we want God fighting against us as we go through this life and looking to follow and have a relationship, hopefully, with God? And if we're really not interested with that, then looking at the path of our life and seeing the dangers and difficulties that come from having God being against us there. Our final question for this text this morning, some things we could think about. What is God teaching us in this text? We'll probably hit a number of things. He's teaching us about the problem of sin. Um, what are you taking from this text that's helpful for you to see and to know? Ms. Eva quotes the, the golden rule in Matthew 7, and Jesus says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, we might think of that as love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, had a chance to, anybody know Tommy Peeler? I know somebody knows Tommy Peeler. But anybody else know Tommy Peeler? Uh, right now he's preaching in Indiana. Had a talk, chance to talk to Tommy on a podcast uh, a couple years ago about just kind of the law and how do we read the law and understand these books like Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And we asked him, what's your top three things for Christians to take away from the law? And he said, well, I don't know if I can think of a third one real easily, but the first two come to be really fast. The first two for us to think and to take away are the great commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I think anytime we read sections like Exodus 21 through 23, anytime we're reading Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, those thoughts need to be in our mind. Not so much of, do I have to keep this? How do I get out of this? What am I still keeping and applying? Can I put this law out, but I can I emphasize? Think about that idea of what principles am I taking that help me to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? What helps me to love my neighbor as myself? And there's stuff in Exodus 21 through 23 that helps with that, that helps us to see that the law reveals the lawgiver. If I had something else to, to think and to add to that, the idea of the punishment fits the crime. In Exodus 21, verse 23 through 25, it says in Exodus 21, 23 through 25, if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Why does God say all of that? I mean, we're probably familiar with that. People quote stuff like that all the time. Why is God making that statement to these people? To fear is not a bad thing. Recognizing that if I do something to this person, there's consequences that come that. That's what you said, wasn't that right? Yeah. I think this text teaches us that God is just and fair. We've made that a few times. I'll have more to say about that in just a second. Miss Rebecca? Mm-hmm. 
their animals, their family, the fertility, all those kinds of things. That's right. Mr. Breck is absolutely right. Uh, there is, uh, it's not buts. We have to be careful with that. God judges, but he also does this. It's God judges and he gives reward. And it's not up to God to say, now I'm going to do that randomly or evenly. God does that as he's told us he's going to do that. And we need to look at what he said about all that and how do we respond to that. Going back to Exodus 21, 23 through 25, all of this, there's fair justice and judgment, and, just, uh, and all those things do come into place. If the punishment fits the crime, that's the idea here. Glenn runs into my car, and so I blow up his house. Those aren't two equal things here with all of that, right? Uh, I'm in a world of hurt probably if I do that to Glenn with a job and with insurance, all those kinds of things. The point of the text, though, is that punishment fits the crime. Something that we can learn about that then is think about what does that say about sin? When we think about what sin, the punishment for sin is, you know, we might sometimes think, well, that's not fair of God to do that. We might think about the point that if God is truly a God of fairness and justice and his punishment for sin is eternal separation from him, what are we to take from that? And how should we process that? How should that help us to live our life with humility and fear and wanting to be holy and righteous like he is as we continue to go on through this line. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I might say, get us to think about the punishment fits the crime and how does that make me want to walk this week, not afraid of the punishment, but in thinking of maybe I don't want that punishment, but I want the reward. So how am I going to live to honor and respect God in this line? Next week, I'm going to be gone. I'll be in Indiana. The week after that, we're going to do at least one more. I think this will probably be the last one of these classes we do. We're moving from epistles and gospels and sections of prophets and sections in the law here, going to a psalm. Uh, so I have a handout. So there's just a few here. If you like something, have something to write on, you can get one of those in just a second. If you can remember Psalm 102 for two weeks from today, uh, we'll use these same five questions and wrap up with that. But we'll spend some time in that psalm looking at what do we like? What questions do we have? We're learning about people and God, and what is God teaching us in these particular texts. hope these classes have been helpful. I hope that whether or not we remember all the things from these classes, and I hope that we do and apply them, hopefully we can at least recognize that these questions are helpful. And you know, The next time you open Esther, or you open Matthew, or you open wherever, you can use these questions in your own reflection meditation of God's Word. Uh, that's all that I have, we've probably got another minute or two before things continue on, but we'll close our class for this morning. Thank you all for being here and for your participation and comments today.